for having me here today. I normally like to talk for about an hour about racehorses and <laughs> very passionate about it. But Andre was very strict with me, he said, you've got just five minutes. <laughs> so I've got to condense an industry into five minutes. So how do we do it? First of all, we've got to understand what the industry is about. In order to help animals and get a better deal for them in our society, we have to understand that the what is that industry about? How does it operate? British racing industry in 2022, um, about 14,000 foals have owned this year between January and June. Um, half of, more than half of those born in Ireland, but will come back over. They will race in Britain. Um, 15,000 horses in training at any one point in time. With 500 trainers, there's 60 race courses, and about 9,500 races every year. Um, of course, a lot of corporate dominance in the industry. It doesn't, it's not just about racing, it's about making money for sponsors, for bookmakers. And there's a big involvement with the veterinary industry. Racing wouldn't exist without a veterinary industry. In America, you know, it's vets who decide whether horses are going to run or not. It's not down to the trainer, it's down to the vets and how, much, how many drugs they are actually putting into these animals to make them run despite the fact that they're carrying injuries. I've never known a racehorse yet come away from a race without a, at least a minor injury. It's very, very demanding. It's probably been an area that's been overlooked for a long, long time. And it's time it was actually put on the animal rights agenda in full force. Not the quantity of animals that are killed in other industries like the food industry or the vivisection industry, but each of these animals are individuals who are sentient beings and they've got feelings and they've got needs and they want to express themselves. They are, um, dominated by people, you know, they're domesticated. It's not their choice, they're not allowed to lead natural lives. And we do all sorts of things with them to control them. Put these in the mouths, that's a loose string snaffle for, for race horses. This is a, a carriage driving bit, a, a Liverpool bit. Horses will work eight hours in those. Um, and these are two whips, different types of whips, but one for jump horses, one for flat horses. And we hit animals with these. And we, it's been taken for granted for years that, you know, part and parcel, in a racehorse, you see it on the TV every Saturday. Um, you know, not a lot of questions asked about it, but at Animal Aid, and uh, we've been campaigning to various issues about the racing industry to get change, and whip, the whip is one of them. Probably a minor point, actually, but it's a very visual thing, uh, so people can relate to it quite easily. Um, taking that further, understanding the racing industry, how do horses sit under the welfare and rights, under the law, we also have to understand the economic and regulation structure of racing. It's a self-regulated industry, so that rings alarm bell straight away, because it's got commercial interests as well as a, a welfare remit, and the two uh, are conflicting. We have to think you know, cultural aspects. You know, racing is part and parcel of, of British culture. It's been around for 250 years, and uh, people watch racing. You know, every Saturday go to the races. Um, how does it sit globally? You know, we have to think about that as well. Um, horses in, in this country, you might think we get a good deal, but from me certainly we don't. Globally, you know, racing takes place all around the world. Um, but probably more, more horses are eaten than they are race, but uh, that doesn't take us away from having a campaign about racehorses. We have to think about political position, how do horses stand in Parliament? I've been spoken there many times over the last decade. Um, I work with a lot of politicians trying to get a better deal. It's very polarised, as you will find with many issues, animal rights and welfare issues in Parliament. There's those for and those against, and there's a lot of apathy in between in Parliament. So you've really got to make a strong case. Uh, and as I say, there's a global racing scene. Britain, British racing industry say, oh, we've got to create welfare standards in, in racing in Britain. We lead the world. It's a load of crap. Absolute rubbish. It's well down the list on, on welfare. Uh, on horse welfare with regards to many aspects and so uh, but we have to when we're looking at an industry we've got to see it in a, in a global perspective as well uh, because of the financial interest in there but what are those key welfare issues i've been looking at racing for a long time my granddad was a bookie i watched racing since i was this high i had horses all my life you know shared my life with horses so um what are these key welfare issues i think the main problem is self-regulation when you've got an industry that regulates itself, it, it, it sets the parameters of a subjective welfare policy. Uh, and that leads to these other things below. Death and injury on race courses. 
around 200 or more horses die due to racing each year, either on the race course they're put down or, uh, or they're taken away and, uh, and destroyed uh, a day or a week or a month later because of those injuries. Of course, the use of the whip is, a, is another aspect that self-regulation allows. You can hit a horse eight times with this whip, seven times with this whip. Well, why not nine or ten? Why not three or four? Why not at all? Why bother? Uh, I did a, a, a research, scientific research paper with uh, Professor Paul McGreevy, who's the leading equine scientist. We looked at the use of the whip in racing. It doesn't really make any difference at all. You know, it doesn't make horses run faster. But horses at the end of a race are really slowing down. They're not speeding up. It's just that some horses are passing the ones that are slowing down, slower than what they are. Um, uh, key issue here, overbreeding. It's unregulated. Anybody can breed a, breed a race horse or breed any horse for that matter. You don't have to have any qualifications or understanding of horses. And the breeding, the racing industry is breed is almost exponentially is, is breeding more and more horses globally. Um, what that what it's for is speculative. It's got a very high failure rate. More horses are bred than will ever race. And what we've seen over the past fifty years is horses are now being bred for, for the sales for the bloodstock markets rather than for racing. When I was a lad, you know, you breed a horse to race. Now, they, as I say, they're being bred to be sold at bloodstock sales. A massive amount of money can be made by breeding horses and selling them on. But the failure rate for those poor horses who don't make it to racing, don't make it to training, or don't get sold in the sale rooms, very, very poor. And that's a picture I took, a horse called Woodmore Hall. You see the vet with his gun in his hand, two vets there. Uh, first time a picture like that had ever been made public. Um, I took a few pictures that day. I actually ended up on the front page of the Daily Mirror. First time the public had been shown what goes on behind the green screens on a race course. That horse has won 1.4 million pounds for his owner, and he was still racing in a crappy 12,000 quid race at Doncaster. His cannon bone snapped uh, near four cannon, went, and he was shot. Um, but those that do survive, what's provided for them in retirement? Absolutely nothing, or very, very little by a very, very rich industry. Um, market forces. Most horses are left to market forces. Where economic volatility, you know, if you've got a recession or whatever, you've got thousands of horses out there. In a recession, you'll find horses don't find homes after racing. But very few horses find homes after racing. And slaughter is an option that many people take uh, their horses to. And I've seen it personally, I've seen horses in slaughter and uh, very, very scared. Horses are really, really scared when they're in slaughter. Very nervous animals as it is. Particularly when you get a thoroughbred going to a slaughterhouse. Very, 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 very scared. And they actually shake and quiver. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 and at Animal Aid, we've filmed them inside the slaughterhouse. And, and they've been abused by the slaughter people. They're sworn at. And they drag through doors half alive. Uh, absolutely shocking. Anyway, I try not to get emotional. Financing, the financing of, uh, of the industry is a key welfare issue. But the top end in racing, you know, there was a, a race meeting the other week, about two weeks back in, in the USA, the Breeders' Cup meeting, there was a horse called, um, uh, uh, oh, oh, flipping egg. <laughs> what was he called? He was called Fireline. And he, he um, he won a $2,000 race, which is a lot of money, but he, two or three days after he won this, this grade one race in the USA, he was uh, syndicated for $200 million. Uh, $200 million dollars million for winning one important race, or so-called important race. But at the other end of the scale, we've got bread and butter horses who run the hearts out day in, day out, you know, week in, week out, and they end up basically earning nothing. You need 15 to 20,000 pounds a year to keep a horse in training. Um, and very few horses will ever win that amount of money. So they're immediately on the back foot and, and vulnerable. And so there's an unequal distribution of prize money. About 100 million pounds goes into British prize money every year. Um, but the top lot always keep getting that prize money. The millionaire, billionaire owners keep getting the large chunks of money. And we're working in the Irish Parliament to try and get tax on winnings. Um, for these, uh, make these rich owners pay tax on the winnings as, as a starting point of getting into the industry. 
Um, so financing is a crucial thing to, to, to welfare. Um, so the veterinary profession for years, the RCVS, BVA, British Equine Veterinary Association, has remained silent on major horse welfare issues. We all know about the Grand National, horses getting killed in the Grand National, but horses get killed every day on those horses. Every day. And this picture below is a horse called Ashby Joe. He's, um, uh, he's either got a, a fetlock or, a, or um, a, a, a hind leg injury. Um, sometimes the, the hooves drop off or whatever, but, but, it, but his hasn't at this point. But he probably could have survived this injury, injury had he been, given, been taken away and given veterinary treatment. Probably would never race again, but it was decided that if this horse picks up an injury between the vet and the owner, the horse picks up an injury, we'll kill him. This horse is called Ashby Joe. So we see the vet here loading the gun. He actually takes three shots at this horse. He blows him through the ear, a hole through the ear, on one shot, blows the nose band off. You can see that just flying through the air there. Um, third shot misses. He basically put a needle into the horse. That vet did, was doing that in 2008. He's still doing it in, in 2022. 14 years he's been doing that for. Never once has he said, why am I doing this job? I'm sure that he didn't go into the veterinary profession to do that, but that's what he's doing. And he's not speaking out. So without support of vets, the racing industry <coughs> didn't exist. So the Progressive Veterinary Association hopefully will be proactive for resources and actually stand up and be a voice for them. So thank you very much.